Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now one thing that really surprised me when I was testing the i7-860 the other day was how well it could actually keep up in some modern titles. Granted the 1% lows will be a little lacklustre and so will the 0.1% lows and by that I mean that you're going to see some stutter in certain games, especially those that are more CPU intensive. Now recently I've been doing a few comparisons with a couple of CPUs here on the channel and in the comments of another video, my i3-530 versus i3-10-100 video, a few of you were saying that I should compare a first generation Core i7 chip with a modern i3 processor, simply because those old chips had four cores and eight threads, and now the i3s have four cores and eight threads as well. So that's what I'll be doing today. Now at first I was going to compare the i7-920 to the i3-10-100, hence why you'll see the CPU labelled as such in the following gameplay tests, but I then decided to use the i7-860 instead because it seems like a more accessible option, at least here in the UK, motherboards are cheaper for it, 1156 boards seem to be cheaper than 1366 boards, and the processor itself seems to be more widely available on the used market and doesn't really cost that much more. That will of course depend on where you live. I therefore decided then to compare the i7-860 CPU, a 4-core, 8-threaded chip, with the modern i3-10-100 once again to see just how big the difference was in modern titles. Now, as always, this is just for a bit of fun. I was just curious to see what the differences would be. Now, we've also overclocked the i7-860 as well to 3.8 gigahertz, the highest I could get this particular chip stable anyway. So it will be interesting yet again to see whether or not this closes the gap between the i7 and the modern i3 and if so, by how much. Without further ado then, let's get into it. I'll put the i7-860 gameplay up on the screen and then I'll put the overclocked results as well as the i3 results up on screen too after we've taken a quick look at a few gameplay clips. So let's get into the gameplay footage. So as I said before, I accidentally uh, marked the i7-860 as a 920 in MSI Afterburner. I did intend to test the 920 first of all, but changed my mind last minute and switched to the 860. So using my genius Photoshop skills, I've changed it to say i7-860 in the top left corner to avoid any confusion. As you can see, Red Dead Redemption 2 performed very nicely. We were using the first balanced preset here, which I feel combines a nice graphical quality with some decent performance. So Red Dead Redemption 2 will run pretty well on this old i7-860, throwing up the comparative results from the overclocked chip and the i3-10-100. And you can see that whilst all three scenarios perform well, the i3-10-100 does, as expected, come out on top. Moving on to GTA 5 now, and here I selected the very high preset. I did leave MSAA turned off as well as any advanced graphical options because whilst they don't add that much visually to the game, well, leaving them off does help a little bit with performance, especially that MSAA setting. Here you can see that once again, we are exceeding 60 FPS with the i7-860. And if we show the comparative results, you'll see that once again, all three scenarios were pretty decent, but again, the i3-10100 does come out on top. The 1% low figure is also important to note because across all of these game tests, you'll see that it is much better than that of the i7s, and that can certainly be where it counts when it comes to certain titles because the higher the 1% figure, the less lag and spikes you're likely to see. So whilst I'm not exactly presenting you with the most intensive scenarios, for example here the i7 was able to achieve over 100 FPS on some occasions because I was just out in the middle of nowhere, um, I was sure however to replicate this using the i3 as well. So as I say, if I was out running around in the middle of nowhere or running through a town, I was sure to replicate that scenario on both processors just so that we were getting fair results. In games like GTA 5 though and Red Dead Redemption 2 that have built-in benchmark modes, well I used those instead. Again it was another nice set of results with PUBG all round. Now Rage 2 was actually quite a surprising title. I have had a few issues with older CPUs and GPUs so it's always quite surprising to see this run nicely on older hardware. Here 
the game actually performed very nicely at the high settings across all three situations. The i3-10100 again obviously came out on top, but the i7 still produced respectable results at both stock and overclocked speeds. So yeah, I was pretty satisfied with this result and with all the results so far. Now in shadow of the Tomb Raider, pay close attention to the following 1% lows again because this is a prime example of where the extra power of the i3-10100 really comes in handy because there were certainly not as many lags or stutters or judders, whatever you want to call them, on screen when using this newer chip. That is something that I saw happen not only in this game but Red Dead Redemption 2 and a little bit in PUBG as well. Some stutter was certainly a lot more noticeable when using the older chip but I think it was certainly to be expected due to the older architecture and it's something that I have seen before in other chips of similar age. Again though on average well I think the chip did rather well to be honest. Now of course the results will depend on the hardware that you choose to use. I'm using 16 gigs of DDR4 and with the i7 I was using 16 gigabytes of DDR3. The RTX 2070 as well may be a little unrealistic in terms of a real world pairing but hopefully it should have allowed both of these chips to reach their maximum potential. With the i3-10100 well you could probably maybe go a little higher. I wouldn't really recommend it. I think Maybe the RTX 2060 would be a good pairing with the i3-10100, the same as the Ryzen 3100 and 3300X, but hopefully, yeah, I've managed to show you what both of these can do. Of course, you may be able to overclock the i7 a little higher too, if you have better cooling or a better motherboard or just a better binned chip, to be honest. So all of these factors should be taken into consideration. So as I mentioned at the start, you're going to still see fairly respectable averages with the i7-860. Where this chip suffers, however, is those percentile figures. You will see a lot more stutter in modern games than you will with the modern i3-10100, despite having the same amount of cores and threads. Of course, we're working with totally different architectures here, and so you can't expect the performance to be too close. That's not really bad though, as far as the i7-860 is concerned. I mean, this doesn't cost a lot to pick up and the 1156 motherboards aren't too expensive. If you're looking for a cheap system, then maybe a first generation i7 could possibly be a good choice, though there are plenty of Xeon chips out there that would probably prove to be a little better. That being said, the i3-10100, I feel, is still a very nice gaming chip. If you don't want to buy into the Ryzen platform. Of course, the 3100 would still be my recommendation because it is the better all-rounder, or the 3300X in fact, but the 10100 certainly has decent gaming performance going for it. In the case of the first generation i7 then, a lot of people weren't fans of the 800 series chips. I personally think they're okay, and as you've seen today, I still think they're pretty decent performers. Of course, pairing one with a RTX 2070 in the real world isn't going to be a brilliant idea. You'd probably want something like a 1060 or RX 580, to be honest, if you're looking at building a slightly cheaper gaming rig. But I still think it's a pretty good CPU. It can still handle itself. And even in those titles like Red Dead Redemption 2, where you might expect catastrophic performance, well, it seemed to do really well. Now, it will depend on what the motherboard you buy as well as to how well you can overclock this chip. Of course, if you buy a DQ57TM, for example, an Intel board, you may not be able to overclock it at all. So you might have to spend a little more on a motherboard in order to get that overclocking performance. But if that's the case, then you need to consider how expensive LGA 1200 series boards are compared to 1156 boards, if you are taking comparisons like this seriously, which you probably shouldn't be. They are just for a bit of fun. This is more to say that if you are still running with the old school i7-1156 platform, then you should still be having a pretty decent time, to be honest. And again, I really am surprised by what I've seen today. The i7s will always hold a special place in my heart, along with the original i5s and the i3s, because even they can put up a little bit of a fight in modern titles, providing it's not too CPU intensive. With all that said and done then, well I hope you've enjoyed this look at the i7-860 in 2020 and I hope you've enjoyed taking a look at the comparative figures when compared to a modern and what some may call entry level or budget i3-10100 chip. 
Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed it, leave a like on it. Leave a dislike if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. I'm well aware that my uh, haircut makes me look like a potato, but there we go. I needed to end with that. <laughs> just, just to let you know I'm aware. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, and hopefully I'll see you all in the next one.